and greet everybody in Jesus name and thank you for the opportunity to come and and share with you um, I told somebody a while ago since I've been here last night last evening and, and this morning and the conversations I have I have the distinct feeling I'm here to preach to the choir so uh, uh, maybe maybe you already understand the things I want to share but I'll share them anyway uh, <clears throat> I didn't grow up in the Anabaptist world. I was raised from before I was born in the Methodist church in the Protestant world. And we grew up quite differently than what the brothers shared. Uh, we, we were taught um, to work very hard, but it certainly wasn't from the same motivation, I think, that I admire about most of the the Anabaptist type peoples that I that I have known. Um, just a little bit, brother asked me to share a little bit of my background for some perspective and and context. Um, I was born into a extremely middle class, normal, average American Protestant family in Central Florida. Well, I was born in South Florida. We lived in Central Florida. Lived there until I was 13. We were we were one of those pillar of the church kind of families. Uh, we started one of the last Methodist church, new Methodist churches in the state of Florida, which was way back in the 80s. So I grew up, though, after that, at this organization that was dedicated to training uh, people in what they called appropriate technology and community development. And they're extremely open organization from a theological standpoint. And virtually, I guess you'd have to almost say the only theology they had was we do good things for poor people. And that was kind of the scriptural basis for it was you know, Matthew 25 and, and maybe um, do unto others as you have them do unto you in a very loose way. And so as I was growing up in all this, we hardly ever read the Bible. We almost never had the idea that we needed to be reading our Bible. It was just not something we did. And if we did, if we had, it would not have been something I would today call a Bible. It would have been some kind of a paraphrase that, that had no teeth. It was very open, very liberal, very... Um, lacking in any amount or kind of discipline or accountability in the way I've come to appreciate about most Anabaptist groups. We have an idea of brotherhood and, and accountability one to another and we help each other in that way. So that's what, kind of where, where I came from. I grew up there <clears throat> and so that being there kind of replaced church in my life. And so the the church message that I got growing up was essentially to be a Christian, we have to do good things for poor people. That's, that's what it means to be a Christian. You just have to do good stuff for poor people. And that message was so strongly taught that <clears throat> it kind of pushed out every other thought and even to the point where if people would come along and say, but there's more in the Bible than just that, they would almost kind of be pushed to the side a little bit and told, well, that's not what we do here. We just, we all kind of ignore our differences and, and all the other stuff. And let's just focus on, on being very, very practical and doing good things, which in time eventually obviously turns into something indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the Peace Corps or some kind of secular organization that really doesn't have a spiritual message to bring to the table. And so we were, we'd still use some of the words. Um, and I don't want to hammer them too bad. I, I think we've done, that group has done an enormous amount of good in the world. And I've seen souls saved through that work too. So I don't want to, don't want to demean it or knock it down too far. But just as an I under, to you understand kind of the perspective where I came from, 
the, the, the motto there is always doing good. Uh, oh, I just went blank. Sharing God's love in practical ways. That's, that was the motto. And, and the director there always had to sing that. And by the way, this man is like a grandfather to me still. Today we're very close. But his, his saying was, most people or most Christians are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. So they're so focused on, in his mind, the, theological questions and spiritual questions and maybe getting themselves into heaven that they really never did anything useful for anybody else. It's all about focused on... And then that was taught, and we, we held that in kind of in an extreme. But what I found as I grew up, and I would go to the mission field, very, you know, different places, serve, and came home, I went to university, went, went to a public high school, went to a state university, got married, Luke was born, family's growing up, other children come along, and all the while I'm working in this organization, doing all the right stuff, and yet having no power in my life over sin, addicted to all kinds of things, nicotine especially, um, certainly not living a pure life in my, my heart and mind, and basically just not living out what we would call kingdom principles and having that kind of power in my life. And I was constantly searching, why? Why is this? I'm constantly rededicating and coming back to the Lord and seeking forgiveness and trying to find power, and I never could find it. I, I spent years and years and years just running around looking in this place and run that place and maybe it's I gotta work harder maybe maybe I need to try more maybe you know and so I at one point I was working 100 hour weeks in the ministry and still just not able to to do and be the man that I wanted to be that I knew God or believed or felt I guess that God wanted me to be and so I kept searching and finally I got so discouraged with with that way of life, I, I said, well, i got to go look for that somewhere else. So I quit that, and this was after 9-11 happened, and we had moved home, and we're working in the ministry. And So I, I said, well, I had another false teaching growing up, and that was the extreme uh, religion of patriotism. So uh, I quit that, and I went and joined the Army in the middle of all these wars, and joined the, the most hardcore special forces contract I could find and, and signed up for all the training and all the school I could get to be, you know, G.I. Joe and, and te sincerely intending to serve and protect and what was good and right. Praise God, he, he didn't allow me to continue down that course. He saved me from myself because I was very sincere about it, just very errant. And he allowed me to get sick as soon as I got there. And after several months, they decided they couldn't use me anymore and sent me home in the middle of the night. Uh, my, my wife thought I went AWOL, and that was kind of funny. But, um, but praise God, that didn't work out. So I, I tried a business that was focused mainly on just making lots and lots of money. That didn't work. I knew that wouldn't work, but I did it anyway. And finally... And I want to say something to the ladies here. <clears throat> I was back working at this organization where I had served before and still searching around, still not finding my way and having long ago accepted that Jesus was the Savior, was my Savior, was, had forgiven me for my sins and all that stuff, but never having surrendered myself to His Lordship because I had never been taught to. I would never been told we need to do this. This is actually, I never saw anybody live it out. Never saw anybody do the things the Bible said to do. It was always just, well, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and 
you know, to him who thinks it is a sin, it's a sin. But if you don't think it's a sin, then, you know, you're good to go. And we, we always, that's what we had. But, <clears throat> and so I had read the Bible, various versions of the Bible, numerous times through the years. Searching, searching, searching. Finally, one day, there was a volunteer came through, a woman, a young lady, dressed in plain clothes and, and modestly and wearing a head veil. It was actually an Amish cap that they wore. And, and, <clears throat> and it made me, just seeing that made me question, wait a minute. Maybe that's the one thing I haven't tried. Maybe I actually need to try reading the Bible intending to live out what it says. And I know that sounds like a ridiculous idea that that could actually be a revelation for a 30-something-year-old man, but a 30-year-old. But it really was a new thought because we had never, ever been taught. We'd actually been taught against that idea. That if you take that too seriously, you're going to you end up being judgmental. You end up being, you know, exclusive. You end up isolating, and you, you, you break those relationships of openness and oneness with other people that you're trying to be so open with everyone. <clears throat> and so it wasn't until I, I saw this young lady, and I, I guess God could have used anything, but that's what he used, to actually cause me to ask the question, well, wait a minute, there's one thing you haven't tried, and that's actually doing what the Bible says. Now, I, I realize that sounds so dumb, but it really was that real. <clears throat> and so I, I set out to do that. I sat down to read the Bible, and <clears throat> with the intention not just to, to have understanding and be able to win arguments and use it for, for other means, but to actually believe that, you know, God actually has a, an answer for me personally here, and if I'll follow this, then I can trust it. Now, that came along a little later when I, we did things, when we changed our lives, we started walking after the Lord, and, and that brought about real conviction and real repentance in my life through which I found unbelievable amount of power over sin that I never thought possible. And I, I actually, I remember I was still smoking cigarettes and chewing tobacco and very addicted to nicotine and had never been able to give it up for more than 20 years, really. And, <clears throat> and I, I continue after this experience I had where I surrendered myself to the Lord I actually continued smoking after that, not really realizing I needed to quit until it started making me sick. God kind of took it away, made it to where it wasn't even a desire I had anymore. Now, I know that's not everyone's experience, but it certainly was mine. And I, it's probably because God knew I was hopelessly unable to surrender it myself. But so I found power over sin and, and started leading my family differently. And I guess you might say come out, came out from among them, came out of the world, so to speak. But we were alone. We didn't have any fellowship. We didn't really believe there was a church out there anymore. We didn't know there was anything like a church that actually lived this way and did this, this way. So we were just kind of there alone. We met another family doing the same thing over in Georgia and started fellowshipping with them on occasion. But for a long time, we were just kind of alone. And that caused a lot of problems. We, it did create a lot of strife amongst our family, friends, neighbors, minis fellow ministry workers, and uh, the fact that we would change our lives. You know, I joined the Army with three young children, went off planning to go off to war, and nobody said a word. But when we changed our clothes and put this weird little rag on my wife's head and... and did all these crazy, wild things like that, they, they sure had a reaction to that. So that created a lot of strife, most all of which has been repaired through the years as they have seen the fruits that have come of it. So that's kind of where we came from and how I got to be, you know, I was asked, how did you get to be an Anabaptist? That's kind of how it was. After some time, other groups of Anabaptists heard that we were out here in the middle of nowhere all by ourselves and started coming around looking for new, new outreach 
possibilities and, and ministries. So we had some beachies from Montezuma, Georgia, Mennonites and stuff would come up some. We had some contact with various groups. And then we ended up in a very, uh, ex- what I'd call an extremely, um, ex- what do you call it, extremely separated group <laughs> uh, in Tennessee, in Lobelville, Tennessee. Uh, it's a horse and buggy sort of charity, sort of, I don't know, ex Amish kind of group that essentially doesn't fellowship with other Anabaptist churches even. And um, so I had a very extreme, and some of my friends have told me, your view of Anabaptist experience is, is very lopsided because you ended up way over here on the far, far side of it. So if my view of Anabaptist, my view, Anabaptist experience is, is skewed, then you can feel free to, to straighten it out for me. And, I certainly haven't found that in my time here and with others I've communicated with um, since then. But my, as it pertains to community development and the the subject we're here to talk about, I remember the day I was, well, first of all, I was very attracted to that, the structure and what the brother talked about this morning, that that many Anabaptists kind of grew up with and don't realize they have. This order and homes and structure and sound teaching and Bible, the love of the Bible and, and modesty and, and um, just the, the idea like the, the Jews, the Israelites would have had their farms all in order and everything just right and the best technology and the best systems and mechanisms. And that the world doesn't, most of the world doesn't have that. And I, I was very attracted to that because it's very wholesome and very good, looks very nice. And I, that was kind of the main motivation for me to find the Lord was, you know, I have children growing up and I realized and I knew they were going to end up growing up the same way I had if I didn't find the answer, didn't find something better. And so that was really what I was after. So when I found Anabaptist people, I was really excited. Wow, there is a church out there. There are people actually doing this, actually trying to live this way. We're not, we're really not the last one or two families on the planet that that have figured this out. We had no concept of Anabaptist history. We had, if we had had any church history growing up, we would have been reading the Fox's Book of Martyrs, not the Martyr's Mirror. We would never have have, have had any of that kind of teaching. we're very much very versed in John Wesley's teachings, but didn't live by them. Uh, otherwise, we'd probably been a lot better off. Um, with a few exceptions, he was pretty accurate in a lot of things. But we, I remember the day, so to please understand what I'm saying, I, I very much appreciated all of those things, and I was drawn to that, and I was really excited. We, we packed up and moved off to another state so we could be amongst brethren. And I remember one day when, when I realized that I was coming from a very different perspective than my brethren on this particular subject when it comes to how we interact with the world and how, what our responsibility is to the world and in ministry. And what that's supposed to look like. The only ministry that church had was once a month we would go over to this boys juvenile correction facility and have church service there with whoever volunteered to come. The, the ones that wanted to get out of whatever other boring thing they were doing at the time would come and occasionally none would come. And that was the extent of our outreach ministry. It's, we had 60 large families in the church. And so I was being who I am, I'm very much about ministry and missions and what are we doing? You know, I kept pushing that question. And the few brothers that wanted to go were in real big trouble for being so presumptuous that they were qualified to do such things. So without being asked by the church, you know. So there was this big movement against the whole subject. So one day we were talking about this after church at a 
brother's house for for Sunday dinner, and <clears throat> and I we were kind of debating the subject, and I was trying to promote the idea that we need to be out there, go ye in all the world, and make disciples. Every man, that's what it says. That's what he said to do. Why are we not doing this? And he said, Well, you know, we we got to get things in order. With, we got problems here at home we need to fix first and we got to get everything straight before we and we got into I think it was Matthew 25 where Jesus said clothe the naked and I started talking about that and he said you actually think that he meant literally give putting clothes on naked people you actually think that wasn't just we're supposed to clothe them with the gospel And it was the first time I realized, wait a minute, are you serious? (laughs) Are you serious? You think that that's just, we're going to spiritualize that? Well, why don't we spiritualize everything? Why Why don't we spiritualize head covering? Why don't we spiritualize everything else he said to do? You know, why, why can't we just have good intentions towards our enemy as we shoot him? You know, why can't we do we not have to actually do the thing he said to do? And so that's what I found in my dealings. And after that, I was very, and probably looking for it too much maybe. Um, Since then, I have found my upbringing was extremely over here. Let's visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction. That's what it's all about. That's what everything is. And to the point where it's, we're just, humanitarian Peace Corps workers. And if we ever do anything and talk about Jesus, it'll be just maybe down the road somewhere we'll get to, somebody will ask us why we're doing this and we'll say, oh, it's because we love Jesus. Very, very limited in the spiritual. And then my experience on the other side has been, well, I don't think there should be two sides, but I'm I'm, kind of seeing uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses if you want to call them sides. But in my experience in the Anabaptist world, in Minodum, as as I call it, um, I find an extreme attention to personal holiness and separation doctrines and isolation and separation from the world. And we have to maintain our holiness. We have to be, do everything we can do to protect our families, make sure they're not influenced. We need all, those kinds of things, which I'm very attracted to. I, I know what's over here. I grew up with that. And I don't want my children over there. I, I don't want the fruits that came of my father's life to be in their father's life or in their lives. So I very much appreciate those teachings. But it seems to me that we've done so, or that is done, to an extent that it, it hinders the gospel going out. And when I read, when I finally did get around to learning about Anabaptist history and the early church history as well, what I found was not people that were hiding in the back of a holler hoping that the world doesn't come and pollute them with their sin. I found people charging the gates of hell with the gospel to conquer a world and turn it upside down. And that, I think, is strengths and weaknesses that I see in my experience in different places that I've been. Um, So I guess you all know the passage that I'm probably going to read now. James chapter 1, verse 27, defines for us pure religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world, right? I grew up with visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction in every possible way. And if we have to sin to get it done, then so be that. God will give us grace too. You know, that's, that was the teaching. That was the understanding. And that might not be everybody's understanding that grew up in, different, you know, in a Protestant world or something. I, I'm not at all saying that everyone is that way or every place is that way but that's kind of what I grew up with that if I have to <clears throat> whatever I have to do to get it done truth is relative and we can move it around if we need to as long as we kind of end up on the 
the heavier side over here on the good, then we'll be okay. And then, like I'm saying, in much of my experience with Anabaptist churches, there's been a very, very strong emphasis put on keep himself unspotted from the world. Almost to the exclusion of, well, we can't really go out and visit the widows and orphans in their affliction because what if they're sinners? You know, don't we have to get them, they have to be saved first, they have to be wanting to be saved first, right? Before we can put ourselves in harm's way or put our children in harm's way, put our people in danger of that sin jumping on us and defiling who we are. And that seems to me to be lacking (laughs) somewhere. Um, and so when I'm talking about community development this morning at least I'm, I'm really kind of equating it with doing good practical things to people for people who need help you know as a very general definition for the moment and usually we're talking about doing good practical things for people who aren't converted so we have to almost throw that in there to be understood moving faster than I planned. Um, Not too long ago, I got into an email conversation, probably through some contact with the Plain News, some other subscribers, a missionary in Africa somewhere, and and maybe one of you, I don't know. Um, Hope not. No, I'm teasing. Um, anyway, we were in, a, in an email conversation back and forth. They, they heard that we work in Congo. They were working in, in Africa somewhere there. And I forget where. I think it might have been Uganda, but I'm not sure. And, and we went back and forth. And I was trying to figure out, well, what do you do? I mean, what kind of work do you do? I mean, you can, being a missionary is a big, broad term, you know. And some of y'all are translating the Bible. So you're a missionary. And we work a lot in technology and application and dissemination of useful technology, hopefully useful technology. And that's, you know, being a missionary and then there are people out preaching on the street and there are all kinds of different ways to be a missionary. And some are better than others and, and some are more practical than others and I'm not the guy who gets to decide that. That's between a missionary and God, I guess. I don't want to tell everybody how they have to do everything. But this brother, um, I asked him, you know, we, we work a lot in technology and, and, and that kind of stuff, and I explained a little bit of what we do, and I was trying to ask him what he does, and he said, well, no, we don't do any of that humanitarian stuff. We just do church work. That was his response. And it struck me that, wow, that's really true. That's how a lot of people consider what church work is. We, we just say words. Words are powerful. Nothing wrong with preaching. And it's a very important piece of the, the puzzle, or it's not really even a puzzle, a piece of the mission, a piece of the, uh, the vision that I actually grew up without. I mean, we didn't have that part. We need to be doing that church work stuff, you know, that spiritual stuff. But I, it struck me as odd that someone who would be on the mission field would not consider helping people practically to be church work when we have such plain teaching on the subject. You know, I've often been intrigued with the idea or with the subject, the, the example. You remember a time when Jesus healed a man? He, before he healed a man, he told this man, your sins be forgiven you, right? And they got upset with him, the Pharisees, because he, who are you to forgive sins, right? And he's blaspheming. You, you're making yourself equal with God. And his, his response always intrigues me. Well, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your bed and walk? But so that you know that I am God, I am equal over here with God. I have the right to forgive sins. 
so you can know that, I'm going to heal this guy. Physically heal this guy. You think about how far did God separate the physical problems people have from the spiritual? How far did Jesus, in that example at least, separate them? Now, I don't want to make them equal. I don't want to, I don't want to sound like a, a new ager or something and some metaphysical realm of whatever. I'm not, not into that. But, and the great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And second unto it, not way down here, but you know, second unto it is to love your neighbor, right? So as a, there is a hierarchy there, and so I don't want to make them equal. But I don't believe that Jesus separated the physical, social, economic problems people have so far from their spiritual lives. Now, there's a strong teaching and I think there's some validity to it in our personal lives that physical suffering can equate to spiritual growth. You know, as the spirit die, as the flesh dies, the spirit can grow. I don't believe that can be done by man. I don't believe we can kill ourselves physically and grow spiritually. Or else we should... We probably should walk around and beat ourselves with chains and, you know, do all that stuff. That doesn't really work. And you can't really make somebody grow spiritually by beating them yourself or oppressing them or, or starving them. So I don't think that works either. So we're left with the reality that Jesus cared about all of the problems of a person. He, he cares about what people care about it. You know, he, he wants us to care about it too. You know, Matthew 25, I mentioned that. Maybe go ahead and read that. In verse, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Verse 31, I'm sure. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations... And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. That's one of my least favorite passages of Scripture. It has caused me more difficulty than most. Um, it's an impossible, I, I noticed in the, the vision of ABT, it has a statement acknowledging our inadequacy and accepting the impossibility of, our, of the vision. This is an impossible thing to live out completely. And so I find it extremely challenging to live by. I'm constantly having to question, do I really need that meal, or could I eat something cheaper? Uh, uh, do I really need this? Do I really need that? Can I live 
differently so more can live better. Um, this passage of Scripture, when he's talking about heaven and hell. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about being judged by our works, essentially. Um, and I don't want to end up in a battle or fight with anybody over work salvation, if I can help it. But Jesus' words plainly say, these went to heaven because they did these things, and these go to hell because they didn't do those things. That's pretty strong stuff. And I think something worth considering quite a bit. I often share that, and then someone inevitably will come along and say, yeah, but he didn't you see he's talking about the brethren? He's only talking about brethren. And as much as you've done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren you've done it unto me. He's not talking about everybody out there, all those other poor people that need help. He's only talking about people in the church. And maybe he is. Maybe I'm, I'm reading it wrong, and I'm open to that. If somebody wants to challenge that and explain it to me, I, I'm fully willing to hear an argument on this subject. But I, I wonder... To that, I, I want to read another passage. I want to ask you if you, if we see a correlation here at all, and maybe there's not, but but I think there is. In Luke chapter 10, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength. And with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And notice what happened next. And he said unto him, Thou, thou, thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. And what happens next? But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, did not challenge the idea that anything to do with loving the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Why? Why didn't he challenge that? You ever wonder? Why didn't he challenge? And often I think, in my experience, it's probably because how does anyone argue with someone that they're not loving the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? How, how can you see that? How does that practically play out? How is that measurable? How can I come to you and say, you're not loving the Lord their God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? unless I look at how you're treating other people, right? That's basically the only way I can really measure it. I mean, I guess if, if I find you worshiping Satan in some overt way, then I can maybe make that case. But it's only by what you do that I can actually measure how you believe, right? And so I think this lawyer felt convicted by the idea, or, or scared of the idea, maybe, that he was being expected to love his neighbor as himself. You mean all these people out here? Well, wait a minute, who is my neighbor? Maybe I can get around it that way. Like a lawyer would do, right? You have a, you have a contract, it's very plain, but then there's this one word, it's written in the wrong tense, and the object is on the wrong side of the verb, you know, or something. And so you have something you can argue and fight over. And it seems to me that's what he was doing here that, well, who's my neighbor? I'll get around it that way. I don't want to be responsible for all, all these people, really. I'll get around that by challenging the premise that these are my neighbor, right? And Jesus answered that pretty plainly. We all know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Who was his neighbor? The guy that was of a different culture, the guy with the, maybe a different language, some he, may have been a different color, a different socioeconomic class, certainly different social standing. The guy despised by modern mainstream society as being a lesser individual because of the fact that he didn't have the right bloodline. He worshipped the right God, but he, he certainly wasn't the right of the right genetics. So he couldn't be seen as the, the good guy, but he was the right one. He was the, the one that did it right. And so I wonder, do we see a correlation between that and the question 
We read Matthew 25. Well, who is his brother? Who is my brother? Who, who, who am I supposed to be taking care of? Who am I supposed to be feeding or clothing or visiting? And I, I, I think the answer lies in realizing that who I am to serve has almost nothing to do with my rights and everything to do with Jesus' rights. Jesus died for me. He died for you. And he died for them. Whoever it is we're trying to exclude from the being worthy of our help or who we're trying not to, to serve by, Jesus deserves the rewards of his sufferings. He died, and we're here to serve him and follow him and to help him to acquire, to gain, to get what he, he worked for, what he gave himself for, which is the souls of men. That's, that's our purpose. And so to ask, well, who is my brother? Or who is my neighbor? I think bears our heart like the lawyers and says, well... Who is it I have to serve rather than who is it that God deserves for me to serve, that Jesus earned the right for me to serve already? And if that's not simple enough, um, in Galatians we have a, a passage of Scripture that I believe nails it down even more plainly. And I've actually heard this passage used numerous times to argue the opposite of what I'm saying. Um, as, we there ha as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And what that part's never used to argue against my point. The part that's always used is, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we're supposed to be serving the church first, and I agree with that. If if uh, there are needs amongst brethren, then we need to be addressing that first and primarily, I believe. But you can't quite argue too much with, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Right? All men. So we either have to define some people as not being men. I guess we all know that men means human beings, right? So we either have to call somebody not human so, and that's essentially, I think, what we do when we say things like, well, they, they grew up differently and they, they don't feel pain the way the rest of us do. Or, I've heard that one quite a bit. Or, they're used to not having enough, enough stuff, so they're kind of used to this. And that, I find that terrible to think that we do that, but it happens. And, obviously, we have people who believe that people aren't men because they're not of the right race or ethnicity or color or something, which is deplorable in itself. I hope we don't have that in our churches, but um, I guess I've found some of that amongst both my Protestant friends and my Anabaptist friends. <laughs> uh, I certainly found that in Tennessee on the way up here. I ran into a man who was preaching vile stuff like that and it shocked me that we still have that happening we don't really have that too much in Alabama to be honest with you at least not openly so that is an argument or at least part of one for why I believe we need to be serving and ministering to people that need help. And that doesn't really say much about how to do that. The brother shared this morning some, one of the very fundamental principles I believe is central to community development, which is, um, and I'd never heard that, that passage used for that point, but I think I'll use it now. Um, but God's law in Leviticus there built into it the need for people to work and and not be lose their dignity and and uh, 
I really appreciate that. We at Adapt Tech, we're, we're, I won't say I'm, we are anti-welfare because I do believe there are times for aid, there are times to give aid. After a disaster and extreme situations, there might be a time when, but that's not where we want to focus. We want to focus on helping people to overcome their own problems and fill their own needs. And so we find that it's detrimental. The welfare mentality tends to be detrimental to that, to that happening. And there are many other principles associated with it, but I guess I'm a little bit early, but that's what I had to share.